Hey folks. Hello. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We will probably give folks a couple of minutes to join in. I've heard there's some power disruptions going on in the Bay Area, so I don't know if that affect meeting attendance. So, thanks. Plus, this is a couple of weeks that America has uh done daylight savings but europe hasn't yet so that might also affect it oh. oh oh okay i think ricardo is also like joining from the phone okay yeah do you know when you'll get internet back ricardo well, they said uh, maybe 24, hour, 24 hours or 48 hours. Wow. Dang. Hey, Heba. I think, Heba, you also mentioned you had some power craziness going on. Hey, everyone. Yes. <laughs> uh, we had the power outage for... Mm, uh, about, I don't know, 20 something, maybe 30 hours, something like that. We had to go, you know, like uh, stay at hotel because, yeah, you know, like <laughs> my kids <laughs> went crazy and uh, my husband uh, has to use the, his CPAP. So, yeah, imagine uh, four of us living in a hotel room for, for a day. It was, a, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> like a vacation. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. I, I would consider this. <laughs> it's a mandatory vacation. It's like, you know, like you have to do this vacation right now. But yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mini vacation. <laughs> yep. I think we're three minutes past, so we can get started. And like all of these meetings are recorded anyway, so that will be useful later on. Um, Okay, so for the recording. So, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Tag Runtime meeting. Today is 16th March, 2023. Uh, let me also include the link to the meeting notes in the Zoom chat. So you all can add your names to the attendees list. Uh, that'd be great. So moving on to the agenda, we have Peter here with us today to talk about cryo. Um, Cryo applied for uh, moving from incubation to graduation and for transparency. I've been like working with Peter at the due divisions. Uh, talk to. Uh, so, yeah, why did you get started, Peter? Yeah, hey, thanks uh, for having me. So, I was thinking of uh, popping through uh, a project update presentation, um, but I need to figure out how to share my screen to do that. Um, so yeah, but, uh, I can give a little bit of an introduction while I kind of, oh, here we go, poke around. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Peter Hunt. I am, um, a senior soccer engineer at Red Hat and I work primarily on cryo. I also work on, um, you know, I have spent some time working on Podman and I work upstream in Signode as well. So I've been doing container in the container uh, manager runtime space for um, like four years now. Um, and I'm here to give a uh, project update on cryo, just saying where we're at and where we're going. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar, the idea of cryo is to be a uh, secure, performant, and stable container runtime interface. Uh, which is the in implementation, which is the way that the kubelet talks to a container manager to actually have the containers and pods be created. Um, for the kubelet to orchestrate uh, OCI uh, containers in production Kubernetes environments. So a couple of key aspects there is uh, where uh, OCI compatible uh, uh, container manager. Um, so, so that means we, you know, work with uh, 
Docker formatted images, you know, uh, container registries and uh, container runtimes uh, that are defined by the OCI. And then the CRI piece is, you know, we work, we're uh, a container engine implementing the Kubernetes container runtime interface. Uh, so the idea of Cryo when it was originally begun was to uh, be a, a container manager that was solely made for Kubernetes. So at the time, that crowd was uh, beginning. There was Docker and also uh, Rocket was in the beginnings of stages of being created as well. Um, Cryo and ContainerD kind of both started at the same time um, with slightly different goals. Uh, but the idea was uh, to have a, for with Cryo was to have a container runtime um, specifically for Kubernetes. Um, so, We'll go into a little bit more about that in a little bit, but you know, just to cover some of the responsibilities, like more concretely. So, it's like one can think of Cryo's responsibilities as mainly spanning uh, handling images, pods, and containers for the kubelet. So, the, the images, what Cryo is going to be doing is authenticating with an OCI registry and then pulling images. Uh, from that registry, verifying that the images are what we expect them to be, and then provisioning disk resources on a node to actually store those images. Uh, then for pods, uh, pod is a group of containers, but you can really think of it as a set of shared namespaces, um, and specifically the, and then within those namespaces, like in the network namespace, for instance, there's some more specific customization that's done. So um, a, Cryo is responsible for, you know, creating the pod level namespaces, and then um, it delegates to CNI project to actually have the networking resources created. Um, and then finally, you know, the uh, the piece that you know everyone like thinks about in Kubernetes the containers. Um, you know, it translates the CRI request, which comes, you know, is trans translating a the uh, a request from the Cube API server to the Kubelet, uh, then the Kubelet translate that into a CRI request, and then that passes down to Cryo, and Cryo interprets that, and then creates an OCI runtime specification for that container. And then it provisions some disk resources so that the container has a root of us, uh, and then um, creates and starts the container within the OCI runtime, and then monitors the lifecycle of that container making sure that the output is being written where the Cuba can see it to then, so that the Cuba can report it up to the API server. Um, and Cryo also is uh, responsible for catching the exit of the container on, you know, detecting if there was a new kill or detecting, you know, what the edge code of that container actually was. So looking at this holistically, it is basically responsible for the, all of the, it's like an interface for the Cuba to speak to the OCI runtime um, and OCI registries uh, in a Kubernetes native fashion. So this question comes up a lot, like why Cryo? Why would I choose Cryo as my, uh, you know, container runtime interface implementation? There's, you know, the the other popular one is Container D, and then there's also CRI Docker D now um, made by Mirantis and uh, there was formerly Rocket, and um, so why would why would one choose Cryo over any of the alternatives? Um, and the the value proposition that we tried to present is, you know, Cryo only supports Kubernetes and nothing more. So this this uh, customization applies to a different a couple of different um, aspects. So like it's performance optimized for the needs of the kubelet. So common operations like listing pods and containers, Cryo make sure that those fat, those uh, hot paths are very fast so that uh, the Kubelet can get its information as quickly as possible. Uh, there is some specific behavior that the Cuba does when um, pod and container requests take a really long time. Um, specifically, when a timeout, or when a request that Kubelet asks of the CRI implementation like times out, the Kubelet will just retry the same request over and over because it'll assume that that request just disappeared. Um, and Cryo actually optimizes this for this so that um, that it doesn't do uh, 
extra work than it needs to. It actually slows down the kubelet and tells it, you know, relax, we're, we're working on creating your um, container or pod. Um, and this can help in uh, resource scarcity situations. And then there are some experimental features that, uh, you know, Cryo has, um, and th those can be enabled through annotation. So in Kubernetes, um, the, you know, the pod uh, specification is a very strict API. It takes a long time to get things into the pod API. And so enable ex enabling experimental um, at, like ex experimental features uh, is tough if you're just only speaking through the API. So Cryo has added support for things like, um, you know, you can specify that uh, CPUs uh, not load balanced uh, and that um, helps in, uh, in high performance, like high throughput applications where a pod needs to like own a whole CPU, like when uh, it's using like a, when the kubelet has a CPU manager running, for instance. Um, so, uh, so, right, the cryo, so it's customized for the needs of Kubernetes based on performance. It's also uh, customized based on um, stability. So um, a question that commonly could be asked of other container runtime uh, interface implementations is like, what version of this container runtime should I use with this version of Kubernetes? And Cryo simplifies that. So Cryo is version tied with Kubernetes. So the minor version, like 1.25.c, um, runs with Kubernetes 1.25.z. We import the correct version of the CRI. Um, we make sure we build at the same level, version of Go. Uh, and we also run um, a ton of tests, uh, basically the Kubernetes end-to-end -end suite, um, as well as our own uh, internal Cryo one tests to make sure that we, uh, you know, are compliant with the, you know, what is expected of uh, container runtime implementation. So um, this uh, simplifies people's decision-making process when trying to like install Cryo because you just have to find the, you know, the corresponding minor version and you can um, be pretty guaranteed that it runs well with that corresponding version of the kubelet. Um, so just uh, curious, sorry, uh, just had a quick question. Like, uh, how long does it take for a cryo version to be released after a Kubernetes version is released? That's a great question. So we aim for a week after the Kubernetes release. Historically, we tend to slip that. So it's been up to a month. It depends on, you know, like the last one slipped a month because we had like a a long-standing CI outage, which made it difficult to verify that any of our changes were actually not breaking anything. So, um, but the what we attempt to do is a week after the um, Kubernetes version is released. Got it. That's quick. Okay. And uh, so, like, do you also follow the same deprecation rules as Kubernetes, like the prior versions? Or? So. Yeah, so we we do, though it's less formal than the process that goes through Kubernetes, so we don't have feature gates. Um, so we've actually considered adding feature gates, but what we do, so typically the features, the, the things that end up getting deprecated in cryo are configuration fields, and for those, we um, maintain a pretty strict, like, you know, one release will mark it deprecated and warn the user through a log message. And then the next release might deactivate that, uh, the capability of that configuration, but not actually remove the flag so that a user like cryo won't fail when that flag is specified, it'll just do nothing. And then, you know, the one after that will actually drop it. So we do in spirit follow Kubernetes deprecation cycles of at least having two minor versions in between when something is deprecated and when it's removed, but um, uh, it isn't as formal as the, you know, the feature gate cycle is, or, and we don't like have an enhancement process that like formally declares that, but we do 
you know, go through a, a mini version of that just through, um, you know, the documentation and the logs. Got it. Thanks, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, so finally, the uh, cryo is customized for uh, the needs of Kubernetes in that, you know, it's a uh, container runtime implementation that is only meant for running um, containers in production. So, you know, originally when cryo was created, the main alternative was Docker, the um, Docker shim. And uh, while the Docker, you know, Docker is an incredibly capable container engine and can do um, many things. A lot of those things are for dev like developers actually building containers. So like, you know, imagine like a, a image building or like, you know, debugging by running, uh, you know, running a container. Um, so those things are uh, useful and needed, um, but they're less uh, required for running containers in production itself. So the idea of cryo was to, you know, only focus on the production use case. Um, and this allows it to have a slightly um, more fine-tuned security posture. So it minimizes the attack surface by having fewer capabilities. So cryo is only able to do the things that the kubelet needs and nothing more. So cryo, the, the classic examples is cryo is not able to build images and not able to push images because the kubelet doesn't need to do that. Um, so cryo just doesn't know how to do it. Um, and that reduces the surface area of, you know, the code and um, theoretically would reduce, you know, and make it um, not more secure, but have a smaller attack surface, um, which um, so, and then um, Corral's also been quick to adopt uh, new knobs to allow users to, um, you know, better secure their containers. So a thing that uh, an ex a feature that it has had for a long time is uh, read-only container rootfs. So instead of having a container's rootfs be read-write, um, it actually is read-only, and then the container user can only really write to a couple of places in a tempfs, um, which really locks down the node um, if you run it um, if you run your containers that way. Um, it was also um, uh, it was a very early adopter of SC Linux in uh, Kubernetes and like from the uh, original uh, release, you know, had full support for um, confining containers with SC Linux. And um, while user namespaces have been added to Kubernetes as an alpha feature, I believe two releases ago, um, Cryo has had experimental support for specifying user namespaces via annotation. Um, and it's had that for like a couple of years now, um, which both paves the path for finding what the eventual API would need to be for user namespaces, but also allowed people to experiment and um, specify, you know, put their containers in user namespaces um, if they felt the need to, which um, enabled, uh, you know, a handful of um, entities to kind of lock down their containers a little bit better um, and make them a little bit more secure. So ultimately, the goal of cryo. Uh, you, uh, you, sure. you, you, you work with the Kubernetes community with uh, to define the user namespace uh, API, or but this is independent from yeah. The Kubernetes. Yeah. So so um, the the cryo uh, maintainer who largely wrote the cryo version of the um, user namespaces annotation, then went on to work on the cap and is actively as one of the authors of the cap. Um, his name is Giuseppe Shivano. Um, and so he is working with Signode now on formalizing that uh, through the Kubernetes API rather than like through an annotation. Yeah. Got it, got it. Thanks. So I assume that's something the container dudes would also use. In Yes. Yeah. So once once there's support in like, well, I think actually there is actively support now because it's an alpha feature in Kubernetes. So Containerd has added support since then. Um, yeah, makes sense. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so ultimately, the the goal of Cryo is to you know make running containers in production secure and boring. So you know uh, a an a, an analogy that um, one of the people that's you know kind of architect Cryo in the beginning, Dan Walsh, he, he kind of likened it to um, you know when you when you choose a file system like EXT or something HD4, you often choose it and then you forget about it. It just like runs in the background um, and it does, it, you know, does the work that it needs to. Um, and you, you know, as a person using the system, aren't really thinking about it very much. And we kind of wanted cryo to do a similar thing where you choose cryo, you know, you make your decision about your container runtime interface and then you promptly forget about it because it just does what you need it to. Um, and it, you know, if you want to research the experimental features, you know, and do some of the things that Crowd can do uniquely, that's always an option. But fundamentally, um, the idea of Cryo is to just work. So uh, here's a little uh, diagram of Cryo and like, you know, describing what, uh, you know, how it is structured. So on the left here, you can see the um, cubelet, uh, is the, you know this entity and it's going to speak to cryo over grpc um with the cri uh you know the uh, protocol and so the cri protocol defines two different services that the implementations need to support it's the image service which is responsible for all of the image relating things so you know it's for pulling images and um deleting images uh, and then listing them basically. And to do those things, Cryo uses the OCI registry uh, specification, the OCI image specification describing how like an image is written onto disk. Uh, and that it also, you know, uses, um, you know, different verification methods like SIGSTOR or other, um, you know, the Docker verification um, to verify the signatures of the image or what, you know, the user actually wanted to be pulling. Um, and Cryo actually uses this library, the containers image library, um, and this is shared. This both in containers image and container storage are shared with other projects like Podman and Builda um, using the same component parts, but like building on top of it in different ways. And then there's the runtime service, um, which is responsible for all the container and pod related things. So in there, you'll be run pod sandbox and create containers, start container, uh, list containers, um, it's also responsible for attaching to containers and uh, opening ports inside of the container. Um, so a couple of pieces that we rely on for there. So PinNS is uh, a project that is kind of lives under the cryo repo, um, and it's a it's for pinning namespaces, uh, which allows us to um, uh, go without the infra container, which was an optimization crowd made five releases or so. Um, so it uh, basically customizing the the way that we create pods and running a pod without um, an extra needless container in most cases. Um, it also cryo, um, you know, delegates to CNI to provision all the networking resources for a pod. So once the namespaces are created, then Cryo passes the pass to the network namespace down to CNI and then CNI rummages around and does all of its um, fancy networking things. And then, um, then the containers can proceed to be created uh, with the networking uh, specified. Um, and then we have the OCI runtimes, you know, your run C or your Kata or uh, C run. And these, uh, runtimes cryo is going to be delegating down to to do some of the more you know the nitty-gritty starting of the containers uh, handling the life cycle of them and the like um, and the containers get have disk resources provision for them with the container storage library um, below here you can see a diagram of what a pod actually looks like and there's a couple there's three different ways that a pod can be specified using a standard run C container. Um, so we have two projects, um, Conmon, which is a container monitor, um, and then Conmon RS, which is a new implementation of the con that container monitor uh, written in Rust as opposed to C, which the original Conmon is written in. Um, 
and we don't have to get into head, you know, super detailed explanation, but um, you know, here we have uh, every pod has a Kanban RS instance if we're using Kanban RS as the container monitor, or every container has a Kanban instance if we're using Kanban as the container monitor. Um, and typically you choose one or the other, but I've in this diagram shown a couple of different ones. So you see here, like this Kanban is listening to this container, um, whereas this Kanban RS is listening to all the containers within the pod. Um, yeah, so that's generally the diagram of, you know, how cryo manages the images, pods, and containers. Uh, I have a question on chat. Please. Just call it. Yeah. So, like, uh, while using Cryo, don't we need the post container for actually creating the ports? Is it uh, the pods container you said? Yeah. Like, for creating the port, like in Kubernetes, we use the post container, right? Right. So, actually, so I'm glad you asked this. Yeah. You know, I wasn't sure if um, I should go into this. So, um, cryo in some situations actually will drop the pause container. Um, the pause container was originally kind of a hack that was made for um, the Docker shim because the Docker shim had no notion of pods. It just had, or Docker had no notion of pods, it only had containers. So, but the Kubernetes authors in the beginning needed a way of creating shared namespaces for a pod. Um, and so what they originally did was they created the pause container, which would just, you know, start up, um, have its namespaces be created by the OCI runtime and then just run pause on a loop. Um, and, and then uh, the containers that would be added to that pod would then attach to that name, those namespaces opened by the pod, uh, the pause container. But it actually, it turns out, you know, Linux doesn't need a process to keep open namespaces. Um, it only needs, you know, some entity to, you know, unshare, which is how you create a new namespace. Um, and then if you bind mount that unshared namespace to a specified location, the original process that opened up the namespace can exit and that namespace will still exist in that bind mounted location and be tracked by the kernel. Um, so that's actually what pin and S does. I kind of briefly described it, but um, pin and S, you know, starts, unshares the pod level namespaces, bind mounts those to a specified location, and then returns. Um, and so it is the entity that is creating the namespaces and it removes the need for the pause container. There's one case where you do actually need a pause container, and that is when there is a pod level PID namespace, because in Linux, a PID namespace needs an entity to keep it open and running, um, that's PID1. So if you think about on a Linux node like systemd or the init process is going to be PID1 in the root level PID namespace. Um, and there needs to be something to keep it open in a pod level PID name uh, for the pod level PID namespace. So in those cases, we do use the infra container down here, but this can, this pod here is an example of one that you know did not need uh, an infra container because it uh, didn't have the, uh, it didn't have a pod level PID namespace. Um, so yeah, a, uh, an optimization that Cryo made a handful of releases ago was dropping the infinite container in the cases that it could um, because it, it itself has a notion of what pods are and it has a way of creating those namespaces without the pods container. So we remove the overhead of, you know, actually creating that container that's just going to spin on disk and, you know, be pausing every once in a while um, needlessly. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, here's a handful of uh, projects that Cryo integrates with, uh, you know, some fellow CNCF and uh, I think six stores. Uh, I forget what, it's not CNCF, but it, it's something, it's a sibling um, umbrella of projects. Uh, but, you know, gRPC is the way that the Cuba talks to cryo um, and the gRPC, you know, definition that is described for, you know, this is the CRI. Um, and so that's used very heavily. Obviously, Kubernetes cryo is only made for Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty important integration. Cryo uses, uh, has its own metrics that are reported to Prometheus if it's uh, available. Um, 
to, you know, say, you know, a handful of things that it's doing, like how long certain requests are taking and things like that. Um, it has, it is heavily integrated with CNI to be able to uh, have CNI manage the networking resources for it. Um, Sigstor, it has recently, like last, like 126, I think, or 125, I forget has added support, I think 126, has added support for uh, verifying Sigstore signatures um, for images. And then OpenTelemetry, uh, Cryo will, has expanded um, support for reporting information on spans. So, uh, you know, the Kubelet has a little, some OpenTelemetry support and you can actually track um, a span from when it comes to the, like API server to the Kubelet to then cryo to actually all the way down to common RS if you're running it. So you can see kind of the whole stack of like how a container, the containers life cycle um, from the API to the, uh, you know, OCI runtime being called. And so here's a non-exhaustive list of uh, some features that cryo has added since incubation. Um, I mentioned, I actually should reverse this list because I mentioned the six door, you know, uh, validation work and the open telemetry tracing. Um, Cryo has uh, recently added support for the node resource or uh, the, yeah, node resource interface, which is a way of customizing uh, containers, um, you know, the resources that are provisioned for containers. Uh, there's SecCop Notify, which is something that we're excited about. So eventually, you know, uh, what it would be cool to be able to, so SecCop Notify is a way that the kernel can tell a process, hey, this container um, used a syscall that it wasn't told it was allowed to do. Um, and then the, the, that process that it tells, in this case, Cryo, can respond to that accordingly. So what Cryo does when um, the kernel tells it, hey, your container just used the syscall it wasn't allowed to, is it'll record a metric um, and a log saying, hey, this container used a um, syscall it wasn't allowed to, and it's going to be stopped now. And so that's a way that admins can listen to, you know, when seccomp is enabled, they can um, be paying attention to uh, the fine-tuned behavior of their containers and see like, oh, maybe I need to update my seccomp profile or maybe actually this pod was taken over by some malicious actor because like I would never want this pod to be able to use this sec uh, this syscall. So that's an exciting um, feature. Uh, common RS support, we went over a little bit about common RS, but that's been a pretty big effort in the cryo community of um, re-implementing the container monitor in Rust. Um, and also changing the architecture from a per container model to a per pod. So now there's one Kanban RS per pod that's watching and you know forwarding all the logs for all of the containers in that pod, um, which will reduce process overhead and hopefully simplify management of them as well. Uh, the allowed annotations uh, concept is the way that um, prior admins can allow certain runtime classes to use certain annotations. So that will, um, so, you know, you think user namespaces, right? Like not every pod needs to specify user namespace and maybe some admins don't want their pods to specify a user namespace. So instead of allowing every single pod to be able to do that, um, an admin can say like only pods that run in this runtime class are allowed to use this user namespace. And then they like the admins can then use like um, API server policies, like you know, uh, how I forget what they're called, what the project is, um, Gatekeeper, OPA. Uh, so it can use policies in the API server to gate which users can create pods and which runtime classes, and that creates a sort of RBAC of like you know all the way down to specified experimental cryo um, annotations so that allows. Uh, an admin to have more flexibility on which experimental features they allow their pods to. By default, we don't enable any of them. So, you know, your cluster comes um, as fully secure as possible, but you have these experimental ways of enabling them in case you want um, that sort of customization. And you can do so on a per runtime class basis. Um, 
And yeah, a lot of these here are optimizations, optimizations for pause and container creation. I went over that a little bit at the beginning, you know, that situation with the kubelet, uh, where cryo is taking longer than the kubelet expects to create a fodder container. There was some SE Linux relabeling optimizations that Crowd made where it won't relabel if it doesn't need to, uh, which is helpful when there are very large volumes that need to be relabeled for a container to have access to them. They can be pre-labeled and then Crowd will see that and ignore it. Um, and uh, dropping the infra container, which we also covered. Um, Figure V2 is you know, a feature that we're very excited about because it's you know, been where all of the new uh, C group features in the kernel have been going for the last like decade, basically, and the Kubernetes world is finally moving over to C group V2. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, those those are a handful. Of, I went through most of them of the you know exciting features that we're excited about, um, and yeah, so. Finally, just a bit of a timeline about, you know, Cryo's life cycle. So um, in early 2016, uh, the, there, it, there was desire to create, you know, a, a run seat based runtime, um, you know, that would be, you know, solely made for Kubernetes. Um, and then by, you know, the spring of that, of 2016, the Kubernetes CRI API was introduced. Um, and so, and the men, many of the cryo developers at the time were actively involved in creating the CRI because there was in upstream Kubernetes, the desire to have a uh, pluggable runtime for, uh, for Kubernetes. Whereas before it was just using the Docker shim and then like rocket kind of also created this PR to be like, Hey, can like we run with Kubernetes to uh, and then the community was like, hold on, wait a minute, we're going to slow down and, and create this protocol that the Kubla can communicate with a runtime with, and then people can, you know, implement the implementation of a container runtime interface. So I was creating May of 2016, and then September of that year, Cryo was introduced, um, and a year later went 1.0 uh, with Kubernetes 1.8. Um, and then uh, the next release, Cryo moved to version matching. So even though it had uh, just gone 1.0, it uh, matched the Kubernetes version of 1.9. And from that point has always followed the Kubernetes minor version. Um, it graduated from incubation to the Kubernetes SIGs in September of 2018. And, um, you know, uh, OpenShift uh, is one of the largest users of Cryo, and it began defaulting to using Cryo in June of 2019. Oh, those are out of order. Oh, goodness. Um, and right before that, Cryo uh, moved to incubation stage in the CNCF. And um, a piece here that's missing that is on the horizon is Cryo is in the process of working on graduating within the CNCF. Um, so we've submitted the proposal and been working through the, the process. Um, so hopefully uh, in soon, um, we can add a new uh, bullet point on this timeline saying crowd graduated, um, which we're very excited about. Some statistics about, you know, how much crowds uh, being used. So it's got, you know, 4,000 stars, almost 1,000 forks. Uh, we've had 173 releases, uh, including uh, patch versions of those minor versions. We've been syncing up with a Kubernetes version for 18 releases um, and have had, uh, you know, seven and a half uh, thousand commits to our main branch um, and 100 contributors and uh, around and 10 publicly listed, um, you know, adopters that have opted into uh, putting themselves into the adopters file. Uh, some of those adopters are listed here. Um, so uh, Cryo is used uh, to, you know, has been used in these companies for a long time, many, it, um, you know, hosting thousands or uh, tens of thousands of clusters, uh, all running on Cryo in production. Um, Nestybox is an interesting case because Nestybox, uh, 
utilize the user namespace annotations in Cryo to create a customized um, uh, offering for their like, you know, uh, more secure containers basically. Uh, and so they were uh, an entity that like specifically needed to use Cryo because of its experimental support for the user namespaces. Um, Quick question. Uh, uh, Red. Uh, how, how many uh, organizations uh, have maintainers in the project? Is it um, mostly Red Hat or are there multiple orgs? It's, it's largely Red Hat. Um, there are some, there's some maintainers from Intel, uh, even though Intel doesn't uh, use it in production, they're, have, they're um, invested in Cryo as a project. Um, we have over the years had uh, developers from SUSE um, and we are also, we have like, there are some um, people in IBM who are building up now. Um, they've been using it, you know, uh, for a while, but um, we're working on kind of developing them there. So it is largely Red Hat though. The, uh, the majority of the maintainers of Red Hat because Red Hat is really heavily invested in cryo strategically. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, just a heads up that may come up in graduation, right? So that uh, maybe like a roadmap uh, for having multiple maintainer organizations. I mean, I, th I think it's kind of, kind of come up in some other projects in the past. Um, I don't think it's a hard requirement, but it may come up. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've been we've been working on uh, you know describing the ways that red, like cryo is not a strictly red hat um you know project there are you know we have uh, worked hard to maintain uh you know company company agnosticism um and yeah that definitely is i yeah i can see how from the outside it quickly looks like red hat. it's just a red hat project um so thanks for that feedback i we are um actively working on developing the crowd community and uh, you know, working on building up um, maintainers that aren't at Red Hat, and um, yeah, hopefully that's reflected in the the due diligence document as well. Yeah, and and I think it's probably what they're looking for is that you have a roadmap or something like that mm -hmm. that that may happen in the future or something. So yeah, I think the concern is, I mean, Red Hat is not going away, but I think if it's from some other projects, the concern is like whether. Um, you know, a single organization might not be stable, or in some cases, the right. that organization they decide to just kill the project and might leave like a lot of end users uh, with no maintainer, right? So and and totally. forced to uh, force move to move to another project or something. Anyway, yeah, yeah. No, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, that advice will uh, definitely be be working on that uh, in the in the process. Um, so since we're talking about adopters, like, is there anything out there which, so if an adopter wants to choose between cryo and continuity, so to be clear, I'm not talking about pitting once again, one against the other, but is there anything out there which compares like feature parity or what an adopter should choose like between cryo and container D if trying to make that decision. I know Derek's also here from container D, uh, but uh, yeah, like, I mean, from a quick Google search, it doesn't look like there's anything that ties deep into this topic, but like most of the blog posts look pretty high level. So I'm curious about your thoughts on this topic. Well, what we like to say when we're asked this question um, is like both cryo and container D are great options. You know, we work together pretty heavily in SIG node to make sure that there is feature parity, uh, at least among the like, you know, Kubernetes cap pieces. Like, you know, if this is an alpha um, feature in Kubernetes, then we're gonna work on, you know, SIG node will work on agreeing on how to approach that with between cryo and container D so that, you know, it is a pluggable uh, interface for Kubernetes. Um, and then we go on to say the difference between cryo and container D is cryo is built solely for Kubernetes, whereas container D is a generic, uh, you know, container manager. And those have differing, you know, you can get different things out of them. So container, you know, cryo can customize some of its 
capabilities based on Kubernetes needs, and it can um, you know optimize performance-wise. But Containerd has options like you know you can actually speak to the Containerd API through a bunch of different clients. And so if you need to do if you need to build a container and then run it directly in Containerd through a specified API, you can do that you know in Containerd. You can't really do that in Cryo because those capabilities are needed by Kubernetes. So it's just about like what you're looking for within, you know, as, as a solution uh, for your container runtime interface. Like I know some um, entities will uh, allow support for both or some will, you know, uh, ch you know, choose one or the other. So it's just about, you know, what what an end user's needs are. As a cry someone who works on Cryo, I'd love it if people gave Cryo a shot um, and tried it out. And let us know if there were any things that they were missing that maybe was working better in Containerd. But um, you know, we while we are, you know, projects that uh, occupy the same piece of the stack, we also try to work together to make sure that both of us are working as best as possible. That makes sense. Yeah. I believe that's the end. And I don't have an ending slide, so you're stuck with this. So yes, um, thank you for uh, platforming me and allowing me the opportunity to um, give a project update. Uh, did anyone have any other questions for me? Anybody else? We got some uh, people on the call from, I think Derek is from the Container D project. Uh, uh, Alex, yeah, uh, from Unicraft. Do you all have any questions? I don't have any questions. Just like to see the update, and yeah, I, I enjoy when we get to work together. Yeah, yeah, same here. There was there was actually a. Uh, uh, a, a good piece of collaboration that we managed to have, I think, six months ago or something was uh, Container D. Uh, like we've been working together on CDEs. So if there's a CDE that would come into Container D that also applies to Cryo and vice versa, you know, we notify each other about those things. So, um, yeah, definitely. I, I feel like the communities are in a, uh, a good spot in terms of collaboration. Yeah, I agree. I do like that. Any, any sort of um, stuff in the past is like in the past, uh, the maintainers have always had a really good relationship between Cryo and Container D is my experience. Yeah. Another question uh, related to WebAssembly, did you are you do you have any plans to support that or I, mean, I know the Container D project is doing something with that, but uh, there's been a lot of um, kind of hype about WebAssembly and, and about support for uh, new runtimes related to that. But is Cryo actually looking into that? So I think Cryo's um, strategy for WebAssembly is actually having it integrated in the OCI runtime level. So, you know, one of our maintainers, Giuseppe, also works on the C run project, which has integration with um, uh, the two different WebAssembly runtimes, Wasm Time, and another one that I'm forgetting at this moment. Um, so we have had plans on describe, you know, writing a post about how one can read, run WebAssembly applications with C run and cryo in production. Um, so it's not currently on our roadmap to add support in the same way that Container D did with like a, a separate uh, runtime shim. Um, so we intend on having it integrated in the OCI runtime level, but we would uh, consider a different option if that was a use case that someone that you know, an adopter or an end user um, had desire for, but it's not currently on a roadmap. Got it, got it, All right, thanks. I do have one question about the runtime shims, actually, since you mentioned it. Uh, to what level does Cryo support runtime shims today? So 
Uh, the only support that we add for it is for um, Kata containers. So we have support for the Shim V2 um, specifically for um, kernel separated containers. And um, so our OCI, you know, our o like what is your, I believe, run C Shim V2 or something. Um, we have we have our own implementation of that, and that's totally separate. And that's what Kanmon and Kanmon RS do. Um, so the we only support Shim V2 for Kata containers because the Kata community decided to um, use the Containerd Shim API for you know for Kata V2, and so you know we uh, wish to continue working with that. So we went ahead and implemented it there. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so I come from the Unikernel community, and we would also build a, um, so we, we approached this with Containerd initially, where we have like this runtime shim. Um, and one of the problems that we ran into, um, maybe it's also kind of a question for Derek, but both of you, I think, would have great insight into this, um, is with regard to how the um, shim from its kind of parent process communicates the networking. Um, so if you think about the context of a UD kernel, um, you, it is a virtual machine at the end of the day. Um, and when it instantiates, um, you have to kind of, you can give it an IP address in two different ways. The first is naturally through a DHCP lease, um, which would require a DHCP server, which isn't necessarily always the case with kind of container runtimes. Um, usually the model is that the container runtime kind of handles the networking by, you know, switching things in the IP tables, et cetera. Um, so we can't do DHCP. The other way, of course, is to pass the IP address to the unit kernel through a command line argument. Um, the networking support isn't necessarily passed via the shim layer to the instantiator, say, for example, run C. Um, the implementation would always requires host-level knowledge of the networking system. For example, if you have um, to see, you know, you have CNI set up, then the uh, interface has to know that CNI is there. It has to kind of pull and look through things. And the two systems work kind of tangentially and not together. Um, is there any way through cryo to kind of help in this process? Or do you see ways that this process can be made easier uh, for a type of runtime ship? I imagine that Kata containers would have done something similar to this, um, but at the end of the day, they, you know, it's a full stack virtual machine, like, you know, it's Linux, um, and the instrumentation is done through SSH. Um, so, I mean, is there any insight that you could provide in this context, maybe? Yeah, I think, I, I think you're correct in that Kata did a similar thing. I believe they, like, I think there are just uh, the pod uh, IP address and like, you know, some networking specific pieces are specified as an annotation to the- um, Right, exactly. The, yeah. yeah, so I, I think I, I don't, we don't have any, you know, more fancier way of working around this problem. I mean, I think generally networking in Kubernetes is, um, it like it's put together uh, kind of with, um, sticks and glue. Uh, the the overall design, you know, has kind of it's been working, but it's you know kind of um, kept together. Uh, you know, uh, I don't I don't want to say happily. It's just like it's not it's not super like CNI is not super. Uh, it's definitely not and I think that this, Yeah. Right. It's just it's like the design is a little bit hard to grok. Like you know, most of the time there's a daemon set pod that's created on each right. node that is actually the right. CNI plugin. And then like the CN, the CRI needs to like, can, yeah. So anyway, exactly. and in a similar way, I think, I think that what you're encountering is another instance where it's like, this is just the way that it works in Kubernetes because exactly. Kubernetes yeah. wasn't like, it wasn't as intentionally designed for the specific use case. Um, um, one of the so. things that I noticed that ContainerD started to do, I don't know, to what extent cryo is able to mimic or have an alternative approach to this is um, with the recent changes that occurred in the sandbox API 1.7. Um, 
they started to move some of these services um, that could be now accessed through gRPC or TTRPC. Um, not all services are accessible actually over these protocols. You, you can't access all of them. For example, you can't um, access the image store from the context of a shim. Um, would or is there a way to approach accessing um, a shim-like interface through cryo possible where we could instrument or ask for information about the container? Um, for example, if cryo was specifying or handling all of the networking, a way to pull and ask, okay, what was what is the IP address of the um, container before actually instantiating the container from the context of the shim? Right. So the, the best way, I mean, like the, the most, uh, the legitimized way to communicate with cryo is through the CRI. So like it is, you know, it would add extra layers for you, but like, you know, it would be to go through the cryo socket and to communicate there. The, um, we do have an HTTP API that does expose some information for containers that was specifically added for C Advisor, which doesn't go through CRI, but does need to pull some information about containers. And you may be able to get the information from that, but that API is not stabilized, it's not versioned. It's just like whatever, whatever we need to put in it, we put in it. Uh, so it's less um, rigorous than the Containerd API is um, by design because, you know, but doesn't need that. It just talks through CRI. So I would say your best bet is to find a way to communicate to the cryo socket through CRI um, okay. and getting the information. But that information is a namespace that like where, you know, because we only think of the monolith of a Kubernetes production server, you know, you by having access to the cryo socket, you have access to all of the information. You can even create containers uh, from within that, um, which I don't know if I'd recommend, but, you know, so take that with a grain of salt like we're not as modular as containerd you know as a specific design choice okay thanks so much yeah just a comment i think it might be better to work with the cri spec right or and, right and then... if, if you wanted to come to sig node with uh with this idea and sort of describe like what you know what you're looking for it's it is possible that we could extend you know the the protocol to better um meet your needs or you know even customize the behavior to you a little bit better so like i mean that's where a lot of like crowd does have a community meeting um but like most of the like this kind of development would happen in sig node because we'd also want to be working with the community community and just the you know sig node community in general to coordinate between the kubelet and the cri sure. yeah I mean, yeah, it's a super interesting, um, uh, I think, approach because I think if the, the 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 interfaces that we would that we you know kind of expect are in the realm of containers break down in the micro VM unikernel space um, because you, for example, might not have a file system and you kind of if you want to access or instantiate something from the context of cryo or container D, well, you're going to be unpackaging a file system right, uh, OCI archive, but that might not best necessarily be a traditional file system. It's just a kernel image um, or an init RAM FS, right? And you actually want to handle that differently. You don't want the container runtime to actually do anything with the OCI archive. You don't want it to unpack it. You want to be able to look up the bits that you need. Yeah, and, and something that you could investigate there is like, you know, I, I don't know how much you've been familiar with the C run project, but it did, I think a similar thing with handling Wasm where like it has, you, you, you pass an annotation and then C run interprets that annotation as like, oh, this is a Wasm container. I have to actually, I'm not going to like, you know, run the, I'm not going to do the normal OCI runtime things. I'm going to like, I'm going to do this special fancy Wasm thing. Um, that's underneath my head, but um, you know, and so I, I imagine like at the OCI layer or, you know, th there could be some sort of work that could be done there. Um, I imagine that the Wasm team did a similar thing, um, adding that support in T-Run. Cool, thanks for your insight, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, folks are at time, but like,
Do you all have one more? So Heba had a question on integration and image scanning and uh, signing in chat. If you can answer it too. Uh, yes, well, I can see yeah, chat so, while I'm sharing. So. Yeah, basically any integration for the image scanning or signing uh, for cryo. Yes, uh, yes. So for image scanning, we don't currently have any great integration, though we are considering adding something where like we expose a socket for, um, you know, third party scanners to be able to ask for images or something like that. We So that, that's a, a consideration that we've had. But we've not really dived into it. For signing, we do have support. So we have support for verifying um, six door signatures. And then we also, before that had, uh, oh, I forget what they call um, the signature, you know, in the, but there was a mechanism that you could use to sign. Um, I think, I think they were like, it was originally made by Docker or something, or like, it, it's a pretty old, like signature verification method. And we have support for that as well. So um, we do have, uh, the, uh, like we do have the ability to um, handle signing. Uh, we don't sign images. We would just verify that the image that is being pulled is signed because um, Crowd doesn't push images and it doesn't like manipulate them. It just pulls them and then runs them. So uh, the pieces, like you need to find a different tool to actually make the signature um, and tell Crowd to use it. But Crowd is in the business of um, yeah, verifying them. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're over time. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I think we have the next Tagline Time meeting next week. So we'll see you all then. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.